you know, Olga gave me the title to the message maybe a week, a week and a half ago. And I was praying, protecting the kingdom, protecting the kingdom. What does it mean? And every night before I go to bed, Olga prays the same prayer. Well, not the exact same <laughs> prayer. But you say one thing every single night. And he said, keep us in the secret place of the Most High. Keep us in the secret place of the Most High, underneath your wings, where no one can touch us, where no evil can come in, not in our dream world, not in the physical world. And so, as I started meditating on those words that are said every single night, is what if if we have God in us, then why do we need protection, right? That's what some people say. We say, okay, I have God in me, so I can conquer everything, right? And that's an <laughs> ignorant statement. And there's so many examples in the Bible of godly men being attacked the different ways, different ways. And so tonight, we're going to focus on the life of one of those men, one of my favorite. And it stemmed from the words that are prayed every night. Hide us in the secret places of the Most High. Hide us in the secret places of the Most High. I'm like, why am I hiding? What am I hiding from? What is it that you don't want everyone to see? Why do you have to keep me in hiding? And so that brought up a lot of questions. And we're going to go ahead and dig into scriptures right away because we have a lot of scripture to cover because it's so well. But I just wanted you to see where the hiding came from and what made me turn to these scriptures and how God elaborated on the life of this one man and what was it that was that he needed protection from. How did he gain that protection? And what was the secret place of the Most High that he dwelled in? Uh, you know, and we think of all these men uh, in the Bible and women that are great uh, men and women of God that have great promises of their lives, right? You look at David, Joseph, everyone. They have great ministries in their life. And a lot of them know their calling. In fact, I would say all of them knew their calling on their destinies of their life. Look at Joseph knew it very early on. David was anointed while Saul was still king. Uh, Moses heard, heard from a burning bush. They knew what their destiny was. It wasn't like they woke up one day and said, I'm going to be a great prophet. You know, I'm going to be this, this, and that. No, they didn't put it on themselves. It was told to them in the very early age or long before uh, they, they, it started being manifested. And you think about that, and you think about the preparation that went into to, to this man called Elijah, right? He shows up in the scriptures when he's ready to go. He's not one of those men that we know the history about, and that's what I really can't wait to find out his training. What we do know is that he was a great man of God, and he was uh, uh, dwelling in the scriptures. He knew the Lord. He had that intimacy with God that you were talking about. He was one with God, right? We know this because of what happened after and how he listened to God, and we'll get into some of those scriptures. I just want to give the buildup of this moment that we jump in his life. This was like the moment where, you know, uh, what the world will call, you graduated seminary school, you know, and you got your recommendations, and you're going to be like, what church wants me, you know? Where do you want me to pastor? How many people can I have, you know? And, you know, that's kind of the moment of life, and, and, you know, kind of the moment where we see Elijah here when he steps into to Ahab's uh, office, to his throne room. Uh, I mean, this is a bold move. We're going to turn it, we're going to read it in just a minute, but the moment that we learn about Elijah is he is led by God to step into the king's throne room, right? And, and to tell him that he's being disobedient. Hmm. This is his big moment. Yeah. We haven't heard anything about him, and this is, you know, he has been dwelling, he's been prepared by the Lord. God doesn't send a messenger to a wicked king that has not been prepared. And so even though we haven't read about uh, his wilderness or his experiences prior to coming to this moment, we know that he had been preparing for this moment with the Lord for a long time. And so, beginning in 1 Kings chapter 17, I just want to read this again because it's so amazing. Elijah the Tishbite, this is how we're introduced to him of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, the wicked king, the king that was not intimate with God, the man, the king that actually, uh, from his actions, hated God. They were worshiping idols. He was leading all the Israelites astray. He stepped in, and he was wicked. As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain these years except at my word. 
Wow. Can you imagine saying something like that? Can you imagine God asking you to say something like that? That except at my word, knowing mm -hmm. that your word is God's word, mm -hmm. knowing that this is going to affect not only Ahab, it's going to affect the entire nation. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect you. You're probably not even thinking that until after you've said it because he was a man of God. He took one step at a time. And we're going to be running over a lot of scriptures, but that's the incredible gift that Elijah had throughout all his life is he took everything one step at a time. Mm. He did not know what his next step was going to be after telling Ahab this. Mm. He did not know what mm -hmm. plan of escape he had. He hadn't planned it out, right? He hadn't thought it through. Had he thought it through, he wouldn't have gone and told Ahab this. You know? <laughs> then he was like, I'm just going to write a note. I'm going to come with uh, lots of other people. I'm not going to go in vulnerable and tell the king this. This is his big moment of preparation. I can't, you know, this is a huge thing for a prophet to go and speak to the king. Prophets are sent into the world to speak to people and to speak to, to leaders and to give guidance and to give direction and to give judgment and to give blessings and to give miracles. They're not there for themselves, they're there for others. Right? They were put in this world, not for themselves, but for others. For others' benefit, for others to be judged, for others to be killed, for others to be healed, for others to be uh, uh, being raised up to life. They're like the disciples. They're not there for themselves. And for this preparation, for this moment, for Elijah, was huge. He did it in obedience to God. And what happened next is the word of the Lord came to him. The word of the Lord came to Elijah a lot. I praise God for that. The word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here. <laughs> get away from here and turn these words. <laughs> you know, I can just imagine the urgency of God's voices. Right after he says it, God speaks to him. Right after he obeyed the commandment to tell Ahab that there was going to be no rain or dew at my word, immediately the next word came to him. Wow. I love that. He took one step. And right before he picks up this foot, he all gets the drag, okay, this way, not that way. And that's, what it, that's the journey that he kept going with God. And so <laughs> the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Sherith. By the brook Sherith. Hide by the brook Sherith. And this is where I got, he had to go and hide. And then you say, you ask yourself, well, or logic might say he had to hide from Ahab because Ahab was mad, right? Well, he had God's protection when he went into the throne room to talk to Ahab. He was able to leave, uh, <laughs> supernaturally or naturally, it didn't explain, I don't know, how Elijah was brought out of that palace without being taken captive, I'm really not sure. They were killing prophets, you know, so uh, I do want to ask him that question too, were you just taken up into the spirit and placed over here somewhere, you know, that is the pattern of your life, Elijah. So I just, I, however it happened, I praise God, but he had to hide. And I don't believe it was for protection from Ahab. I don't believe it was for protection of Ahab at all because uh, Elijah was protected in the throne room. Elijah was protected on Mount Carmel. Elijah was protected everywhere he went. It doesn't matter where you go. When you're going where God has called you to go, you will be protected. Yes. So this protection that we're asking for in the kingdom of the Lord isn't a protection from uh, natural things or other people. Uh, we need to be protective a lot of times from ourselves. You know, because it is the protection of ourselves that keeps us in obedience to God. If we are not protected, we may not act in obedience to God's word. As the word of the Lord came to Elijah, we will read on, but he did it immediately. And he followed those commands. And because he did, he then heard the next word, and then the next word, and then the next word. See, God doesn't tell us the end of the story uh, or, or say, this is, you know, he doesn't give you a, a perk chart of everything that's going to happen in the end result. Where is the faith in that? Correct. Where is the faith in that? And I think about my own life when you're told to do something crazy and to go and talk to Ahab and then run in hiding. You know, I had to talk to a type of Ahab. <laughs> I had to say, I'm leaving. And be before that happened, I heard the voice of God. 
And you know what, what God told me in that moment when you know everything became clear or, or what the direction of my life was? I didn't know anything that was going to happen in the future. I had no idea. Had God told me I was going to end up here, I would have said, I don't believe it. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. And so what God told me one day in prayer, I was in deep prayer. I cried every night to the Lord. I cried every night to the Lord just to give me strength. Not to help me to, to do anything, just to give me strength for the next day, to help me to be a, a better person, to be a servant of the Lord, not the servant of Ahab. Mm -hmm. And every night he heard those tears and he told me something. The word of the Lord came to Sophia and said, if you don't get out now, you'll never have a chance again. Mm -hmm. I heard it, literally, it made me shake. It made me shake. It's like, ah, uh, you know, because we want to postpone things, right? We want to say, I'm not going to go talk to Ab right now. He's really mad, you know, or he's going to get really mad. We're going to wait, you know, till the kids are all old and all, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, this is human mind. So to hear that word, say, if you don't get out now, you will never have an opportunity again. There's one opportunity. That's why I really like that Eminem song. <laughs> that's why I have I have a personal bond with that. You have one chance, you have one opportunity, because that's basically what God told me in a much holier way. But in a, in a, and it made me it made me scared. It made me shake. But I praise God that sometimes when there's a lot on the line, when there's a lot at stake, He will be stern with you. Mm -hmm. He will tell you oh, things yeah. that you don't want to hear, and He'll make you shake in your feet, things, saying, "I can't do it." But greater is he that is in me than is in the Lord. And I had no idea what the next steps were. You just there do you one go. thing, and then all of a sudden, another thing happens, and another Correct. thing happens. There you go. And there's so many parallels <laughs> in the continuance of this story, <laughs> which we will go into. And so, the, this section of, of Elijah's life is just so great. Because when God is protecting you, he hides you, he leads you, and he feeds you. We don't need, as men of, and women of God, we don't need anything else. As long as God hides you, He leads you, and He feeds you, you have everything that you need. Everything. No circumstance matters. It doesn't matter whether you're being fed in a palace or in a prison. It doesn't matter if you're being led out of Egypt or into the Promised Land. It doesn't matter if you're being fed by ravens or fed by kings and widows or anything. It doesn't matter. The thing that God wants to do when you're under His protection, when you're underneath His wings, He is hiding you, He's feeding you, and He's leading you. But He can't do those things if we don't hear Him. If you don't even hear the voice of God at all, how can you be led by Him? Many people and many pastors look at these scriptures and these passages from Elijah and say, well, Elijah heard a lot from the Lord, but now we hear in a different way. Now we have this we Bible, have Bible. That, that speaks yeah. to us. Absolutely the Bible speaks to us. I'm not arguing that, but I know that God also speaks in a different way. It, it, I'm not saying he comes down and, and comes on your loudspeaker, on your on your wireless speaker as a Sophia. No, that's not how he came to me. Maybe how he comes to you. He, nothing is impossible with him, but being in that intimacy with the Lord and... and uh, if you're not hearing from the Lord in your prayers, even in, in a, uh, you get a sense, you get a feeling, you get uh, an intuition about something, you get uh, a, a warm feeling. He talks in, uh, he, he doesn't just talk in a voice. Right. It's not, uh, you know how voice and sound is waves, right? It's a frequency. And there's many frequencies that we don't hear. Like when dolphins talk to each other, right, Billy? When they talk, we can't hear it. But there is, we know that there's frequencies that are uh, above our hearing, right? The same is true with God's frequency. And we need to be uh, trained in our ears to hear it and be trusting. Because he'll give you one thing, which is like God speaking in a feeling, right? Because you can actually feel sound waves. If you go close enough to a speaker, you felt it. It's like, like you feel it. You can feel sound. And so if you get a feeling when you're praying, that's God speaking to you. Praise God. It's not just a feeling that you got. That's God speaking to you. You're getting closer to that loudspeaker, you know. God is always telling you, come near, come near. Why? Because we're pretty deaf sometimes, you know. <laughs> we got to get real close to that loudspeaker and be like, bah! you know. Get it through your thing. 
big head, I'm trying to speak to you. It's not just like, oh, that gave me a cozy feeling. No, you don't give yourself feelings. Man, if you could give yourself feelings, you'd make yourself fall in love, you'd make yourself happy all the time, I would make myself feel joyful, and yeah, that would be awesome if I could just make myself feel stuff. I'm sorry, you can't. The enemy can make you feel, and God can make you feel, and other people can make you feel. But you can't make yourself feel. And so I just find that. also need to understand that this mm -hmm. Bible that we are reading today, the words were spoken to somebody exactly. and they were recorded for us. They started as spoken words, God speaking. Yes. And then somebody wrote the, what God said in, a, in, 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 in so it, it became a Bible now. Right. Because now we are reading the words that were said to somebody. Mm -hmm. So when God spoke to Abraham, he wasn't reading the Bible. No. He, that's why the Lord exalts that man so much. Abraham believed that he heard the voice of God. Yes. And it became to him righteousness. Amen. It was accounted to him righteousness. So why is the Lord, yes, today we have the Bible, which is awesome. So we have a reference book that we can go to and say, well, you know what? I'm not the first person that's heard the voice of God. All these men, the prophets, mm -hmm. Abraham, Joseph, all these people, they heard the voice of God too. Yep. So why is God choosing to speak to this man and refusing to talk to me? Mm -hmm. And I call myself a, a child of God. Well, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. Why is God talking to Joseph, to Abraham, to Job, to Elijah? Why was he talking to them? And now when it comes to my turn, he's not talking to me. Yep. He just said, oh, just go read your Bible. Yep. Really? How about the specific direction for all those life? Yes. Is that in the Bible? No. Yeah. It's not in the Bible. How do I get the specific direction for all those life? Yeah. Who tells me that? It's not in the Bible. Correct. I can read that Bible. I can know all the words in that Bible and I don't have a specific direction word for all those life. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if I'm intimate with the Lord, I will hear words. I will see a vision. Yes. I will have a dream. Amen. It still happens today. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Mm -hmm. The door is open. Mm -hmm. Praise God. I mean, there's just verses like, you know, in Isaiah where he says, when you hear that voice that says, go to the left. Yes. There you go. Right. And it's like, yes. okay, did that stop? <laughs> exactly. When did that stop? When did that stop? When Peter and them died? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Seriously? I know. And then why was the prophecy for your, your old men will see visions and your young men will dream? What was the point of that That's you know, right. when you received the Spirit? Mm -hmm. okay. It all stopped when the apostles died. Uh. <laughs> the same church that preaches that you should have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the same church that preaches that God does not speak anymore. Mm -hmm. I said, do I have a relationship with the dead God? Mm -hmm. A mute God? Mm -hmm. Did somebody put duct tape on his mouth? I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and He speaks to me. Yeah. Amen. Not yeah. because I'm special, because He's God. That's right. And He desires to speak to all of us. That's what I'm saying. Even if you haven't uh, been trained or believe that you, the feelings are not from yourself, they're from Him. And what He wants to do is to gain that trust in you where when you hear it, you will act upon it. He doesn't just tell you something cozy, you know, uh, something, you know, uh, as he said, whisper something sweet in my ear. God doesn't just give me whisper something sweet in your ear, you know. <laughs> Usually when he comes and talks to you, it's for a purpose. It's because he wants you to do something, you know. He's not that like, nice and romantic God, you know. Let's just tell me something nice, you know. <laughs> A purpose and for a reason and for us to obey the word of the Lord the word of the Lord it comes is usually a, a, an instruction an instruction of what to do an instruction of what to say an instruction of where to go an instruction of the next step that you're taking in your journey into your destiny and so he heard the word of the Lord came to him saying get away from here and turn east and hide by the brook of Cherith." and so he went and did according to the word of God and we're not going to go into the details because I know we've already spent a lot of time in these scriptures, but he went and did according to the word of the Lord. 
So not only did he hear the word, he went and did according to the word. And that's the most important thing that we can do when we hear God. When you get that feeling, when the, the, the loudspeaker is in your ear and you have this feeling like, oh, I need to pray for this person or I need to call this person or no, I need to go and do this right now. Don't dismiss it. Go and do it and see what happens. Because if you don't obey that part, you won't hear the next instruction. Mm, wow. Because he teaches us and talks to us one step at a time mm. in the walk of faith. Mm. And so if you're not hearing from God uh, in your prayers, it is a possibility that you have not obeyed what you've already heard from him. Mm. You could have, you know, if, if you have it, if God came and told me, Sophia, you need to uh, uh, go and see this person and pray for them. And I say, oh, I don't really believe that was God speaking to me. I'm just, or I forget about it and I don't make it a prayer day. I don't do according to the word. God may have the mercy and speak again, but he may not. He may just be waiting and waiting and waiting. And here I am. I'm not hearing from God. He's gone silent. Hmm. He must have fallen asleep. But here, he's just waiting for you to take that one step that he asked you to do in the first place. And so when you feel that God is being silent, or that he's not speaking, ask God to say, repeat it if I missed it. You know, he's a merciful God. Did I miss something that you told me to do that I'm not doing? He'll repeat it. He answers prayer. Ask and you shall receive. And so when we don't hear from God, it could be that we're walking in disobedience, either out of ignorance or out of the fact that we just don't want to do it because we think it doesn't matter. I mean, even Elijah here could have been like, I don't want to go to uh, and hide by some brook with nothing there. Remember, he had been prepared for his big moment of ministry, right? He'd been going into the palace and talking to the king. This is his big moment of ministry, and now he has to go hide by a brook? Wow. I've been prepared so long. I've been reading the scriptures. The Israelites need me. They have fallen to the wayside. They are worshiping idols. Use me, Lord. Every prophet wants to be used for the kingdom. And here he's being told, just, just go hide. Yep. Just go hide for now. You've done your part. You've said your one sentence. Yep. Go hide. Hmm. And the scripture says that he was there for a little while. Not a short while. <laughs> Not a terribly long time. But I don't know. Long However enough. long that is. Six long months. Long enough for the water to dry up. A year. Up. Exactly. There you go. How long was that? I How don't think that was, was a day or a week. That wasn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. It was there for a long while. And so, when we as men and women of God, we have been preparing, preparing, preparing for a long time, and we feel that God has taken us to chair, to the brook. You know, don't, he's preparing you for something even greater. Uh, Elijah had to go to the brook before he went to Mount Carmel. Uh, he had to go to the brook and he had to go to the widow before he went up on Mount Carmel. Uh, many of the great men of God had to go through their Cherim experience uh, in different ways. David was stuck in the wilderness while Saul was trying to kill him. Joseph was a slave and then in prison. Moses was stuck in the desert yep. for a long time. 40 years. Yeah. Paul was uh, uh, was in a different country three years after his uh, transition moment. Arabia. Arabia, yeah. thank you, before he went on his first mission trip. Mm -hmm. And so they all had these uh, moments where God was hiding them to prepare them for their bigger mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking to Ahab was not the climax of Elijah's life, praise God. Praise but in that moment, that's when he came out. And then God took him into hiding in the same way that uh, <laughs> the Lord has dried up a lot in the sanctuary. But he's using this experience to prepare us for the Mount, Mount Carmel experience. Yeah. I know it. He's taken us to the brook. The brook has dried up. <laughs> and we've been fed by ravens. Yeah. Oh, we've been led by God. <laughs> yeah, it's been awesome. It doesn't matter where we're being fed, <laughs> by the brook or in the palace. Like I said, as long as we're being fed, led, and hidden, <laughs> we're in hiding praise, right now. Praise, praise Jesus. God. We're in yeah, hiding, we're being led, and we're being fed. I said, that's, that's, that's right. three things that you need in order to be prepared for the glorious, miraculous manifestation of God's promises on your life. And so, my friends, we've been to the brook, 
And we're going to Mount Carmel whether you like it or not. <laughs> I, I think I like it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get there. I don't know. There's some details there. You can... There's some details. <laughs> so then, <clears throat> Elijah and the widow, Then the and this is in verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him again, saying, Arise and go to Sarephath. Oh, and he arose and went. <laughs> Again, just the, the pattern of hearing the word of the, of the Lord. Just saying one simple thing. Arise and go to Seraphim. Okay? That would be like God coming and saying, you, Arise and go to Chandler. You say, where in Chandler? Where am I going? What, for what purpose? Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Yes. Wow. And, and he just went. And he went and he followed the word of the Lord. Now we're going to skip forward a bit here <clears throat> into chapter 18. Uh, where, which is after he has now um, been with the widow for three years. He was with the, the widow and her son for three years. Hmm. Elijah's first church had two people in it. <laughs> Man, this is big. <laughs> this is big. Elijah's first church had two people in it. A widow and a boy. For three wow. years. And he did it joyfully. And he did it lovingly, and he prayed for her. He brought that he brought healing to this boy. He was bringing the gospel to her. He was performing miracles every day with the oil and the and flour and the water. I mean, God was working in this ministry of His mightily. Small beginnings. Small beginnings. Small beginnings. That's that's a huge revelation. I never thought of uh, the fact that this was. A, a, a time or small beginnings for the prophet Elijah with the widow of Zarephath. You're right. That's, that was his ministry for three years. Mm -hmm. And one can't imagine someone that has been so empowered by God, someone that would say, hey, there will be no rain except at my word. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful prophet. Mm -hmm. And so God takes that kind of powerful prophet and puts, it in a, puts him in a home of one person, two people, for three years. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's like, wow. Really? I mean, most of us get impatient and say, wow, God, how can you... You've trained me just you've for You've trained this? me so much just for this? Just to be in a home for three years? Mm -hmm. And mind you, Elijah didn't know when it was going to be over. No. God could have kept him there for 10 years. That's right. He was 20 happy. years. But, yeah. He was joyful. Whatever. <laughs> he doesn't I, I mean, the will of God. God. I'm in the will of God. That's and it. he knows that when it's time to go, God will speak to him because God has spoken in the past. That's right. And so he's been led. And so when you've been led by somebody and you've trusted and obeyed and you've walked with a person for a while, you know that they won't lead you astray. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like take the trust test, you know, like you, you get blindfolded and then you ask a friend to lead you and see how, how really you trust that person. If at all, you'd be like, ah. you know, you're not really going to be very trusting in the beginning, but if you have walked like that with the person hand in hand for a while, you begin to walk faster. You begin to trust that they will say curb before you hit the curb, that they will say wall before you walk into the wall, you know, hopefully. <laughs> but that's just a, a simple example of how he's been led for a while by the Lord. And so he's, he's just walking in his steps and he's knowing, he's waiting for the day. He knows the destiny of his life. He knows that there's more. He knows that there's a more carnal experience for him. Uh, but he doesn't argue with God. He doesn't uh, bring it up to God. He doesn't complain to God. In fact, he takes on this ministry joyfully, with love and with compassion. And he, I love that. Because wow. we know that later on it says that Elijah was a man of like passions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then that just that reminds me is that Elijah had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. He had to choose. To believe the Lord, choose to be content, choose to remain patient, choose to. Yeah. And it's not easy mm -mm. because he was a man of like passions. Yeah. We know how he feels. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. And like you said, it's, it's especially when he knows that he's been called to do some mm -hmm. great things. Yeah. Exactly. But yet he's waiting on the Lord. Yeah. And I'm not saying that Elijah was a perfect man. I'm not calling him Jesus. I'm not saying he didn't have his moments in this prayer time. Fulfill the promises, la, 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 all he these did. things. Yeah. Oh, he did. He, he pushed did. through. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. He so did. it wasn't like he was 
happy where he was at in the spirit. Like he knew that there was more and he kept praying it and kept praying it, kept asking for it and kept believing it. And God knew when the moment was because as soon as the woman said, now I know that you're a man of God and that the word in your mouth is true. Boom. The word of the Lord came to Elijah again. Dumb. He had a mission in that church to bring faith into this woman and to make yeah. her know that God is God wow. and God is Jehovah and God is the God of the universe and he can do anything because this widow mattered to God. Yep. Hmm. Wow. And she was not an Israelite. Exactly. exactly. She mattered so much. Jesus Christ himself mentioned the widow of Zarephath. Amen. And he did not get a pleasant response. He did not get a pleasant response. <laughs> he got almost thrown off the cliff. That's right. That's right. That's how much this Praise mattered. God. Right? That's how faithful Elijah was till the end. Mm -hmm. yep. You know? So he didn't leave when, before the first mission. Was that's right. Leave. So when the widow and her son were being fed, that wasn't the uh, all Elijah was sent to do. That no. was his part. That was his part, mm -hmm. and he fulfilled his mission till the end. And you're right. When the lady, the widow, said, "Now I know. <laughs> now I know it." Like say, "Now I believe. I really believe now." Mm -hmm. Well, maybe she, her faith had not been complete. Yeah, she the was faith, also being fed. She was also being fed, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what it wow, that's yeah, amazing. So Elijah's mission is would you be willing to wait three and a half years to save one soul? Mm -hmm. One. Oh, that's it. Two souls. Yeah. Two souls, yeah. Would you be willing to wait? <laughs> but what's interesting, God never posed that question in the No, beginning. no, he doesn't. He doesn't pose that question. No, he won't. Well, we can ask ourselves. Yeah, we know from reading this story mm -hmm. yes. that that was the that was the that was the main question. Yep. Would you be willing to wait three years yep. in order to save one little widow another, and his son? And another, son. Power, another powerful testimony that um, I think I've shared with you before, but is that my mom shared with me at her church is that a woman. It was they actually. Cause my mom loves it. Is that they. Now that the newer contemporary, it's not allowing it so much, but before they would have the testimony service, testimony time in church. And my mom loves that, you know? And a lady stood up to testify, and she said that she wanted to praise God. And the reason she was praising God was because her husband was sitting next to her that night in church. That she had been praying and had received Christ, that she had been praying 60 years. Years. Crazy. What? 60? 60? Six zero. 60 wow. years Whoa. for her husband wow. to come to Christ. Wow. Praise God. And I was just like, when my mom told me that, I was just like, wow, mom, <laughs> that is awesome. Just 60 wow. years to be praying for your husband, to stay faithful yes. wow. to the end. I mean, we thought Elijah three and a half years. That one went, <laughs> that one went just like wow. blew the wow. socks off of I was just like, oh, I mean, it just, it's like almost like you want to drop the phone when my mom told me that. Uh, it was like 60 God. years. Wow. Most people would have given up. Oh, wow. absolutely. Oh, yeah. man. Most people would have, that's a godly woman wow. to keep praying Amen. and to be wow. so excited. Wow. But that just that, God. again, that just goes back to stay your post. If and God's told you to stay, you stay. Stay yeah. your post. Don't move. Yes. And it's a great test that Elijah passed too because he had a, a, a strong desire to save Israel. Yeah. Yeah, and to did. save the Israelites. Yeah. And so if you have that strong compassion to save the nation, hmm. could you be willing to save this Gentile? Yes. Yeah. Look at the wisdom. You know? Of the Lord. Yeah. This, we all are given Man. tests. That's why the Bible is great. This is his test because yeah. he had that strong compassion to save yeah. the Israelites from uh, bowing down to Baal and from yeah. forgetting about God. And God sent him to a Gentile. Yeah. If you love me so much, would you do this for me? Yeah. Wow. Because in this moment, she mattered more to God than the Israelites. Uh, wow. They can, well, they can wait. Wow. They can wait. They can wait for three years without water. <laughs> and they're dying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They're dying. They're oh, dying. Yeah. Yes. Wow. That wow. was the test wow. for him. And I love that. Wow. Wow. That's, why, that's why they wouldn't throw Jesus off the cliff. <laughs> of course. Yeah, this widow cost them a lot of, of people. She yeah. <laughs> 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 was pretty hard headed to her three and a half years. <laughs> oh, you talking yes. about someone piercing the heart. That, oh, those that were pierced their heart. That's why they wanted to kill him. 
kill me. That's right. They're yeah. like, oh, you wow. touched, you went, you went there. You yeah. should not have went there. <laughs> and it, it was absolutely. Not the weed of Zarephath. Don't bring her up. That's right. Praise wow. God. That God let his people fun. die and starve, but yet save the Save widow this woman and her son. Before you can save Israel. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a huge one. That's a Praise huge God. revelation right there. Praise God. Would you be willing, and just as Brad said, would you be willing to commit your life for three years in saving this Gentile yeah. and her son? Mm -hmm. Amen. Wow. Well, praise God for Elijah's obedience mm -hmm. and for his attentiveness to God's voice and for never second-guessing the word of the Lord that came to him. That's why he was called righteous in the book of James. Remember that Abraham was called righteous because he heard and believed God mm -hmm. and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's why this man was called a righteous man. You got it. That's why. Because of these things that we're reading here. Amen. He heard the word of God. He obeyed the word of God. Amen. That's why he was called a righteous man. Because, Amen. Because obedience is better obedience. than sacrifice. Yeah, Amen. obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah. Yes. So for us as well, notwithstanding, because again, as Brad said, the Bible said that this is a man of similar passion. Yeah. What does that mean? Similar He's just passion. like us. He's just like us. So he may get angry sometimes. He may get depressed sometimes. Oh, we know he that. May get, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one we he know. May, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There may be a, yeah, a number of fleshly yes. uh, problems Correct. with this man of God. He, get, he gets angry. He <laughs> gets angry. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So there's a fleshly problems with this guy, but yet the man was called righteous. Yeah. Amen. He was still called righteous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? He heard and he obeyed the, the voice. The inner man heard and then, then the outer man followed the inner man. That's right. So many times we want the inner man to follow the oh, outer man. Right. You know, I'm going to go here and do my ministry over here. Yeah. And the inner man is like, uh, that's not where God wants you to go. I'm not going to come with you. You know? Oh, man. And so the inner man has to lead where we're going and let the outer man fall away because then Jesus goes before you. Amen. Because Jesus is in us and if you're not led by the inner man, then you're yeah. automatically putting Jesus behind. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I've, so I've heard it said of, you know, like um, some wise counsel I've heard before is like uh, young pastors coming out of seminary, you know, because they're just full of, you know, you know ambition and just oh, yeah. they're ready to no, serve God and no. conquer the kingdom and, mm -hmm. you know, win souls. Yeah. But yet, Go serve. Yeah, go, they need to go to the dry brook. For yeah. A go while. go clean some toilets. Yeah. Yeah. Go, you know, be a nobody. Yeah, that's right. And they they're not like that. Yeah, of course. Not. <laughs> Majority. Yeah. But God's they hear his voice. That's right. Yes. And they do it. That's right. Amen. And they say, Yes, Lord. Yeah. I'm Amen. here to serve. Wow. Wow. Amen. Amen. Thanks God. Amen. What a great man. Hmm. And so there he is. He's fulfilled his mission with the widow, and God comes to him again and says in the third year, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on earth. So again, he's taken that step. He's done with that step. Immediately, God tells him where to put his foot next. Okay, go to Ahab and tell him that I will send rain on the earth. And so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Um, now, when he did this... Um, there's a little bit of section here talking about Obadiah. Obadiah was the master of Ahab's household. And what happened was that Ahab went one way and Obadiah went another way to try to look for water because the famine was so bad that there was drought everywhere. And so they had separated. And Obadiah was a Christian, he was a believer, he was a man of God. And so instead of trying to find water and food for the cattle, that Ahab was trying to save his livestock. He wasn't trying to save people. He was trying to save his cows and his donkeys. Not the people of Israel. And so Obadiah, because he was on the other side of the land, he was taking the water and the food that he was gathering and hiding prophets in caves. You know. By 50-50. So yeah. hiding prophets and feeding them and giving them water. This is what he was doing while he was having control over Ahab's house. But And so then it comes down in verse 7, 18, 7. Now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him. I love that. Suddenly, he's being transported in the chariot of fire again and then just appears in front of Obadiah. It doesn't say they met on the road, la la la. He came, he was brought up in the spirit of the Lord and plopped down. I believe it because what he says to him later will prove it. What Obadiah tells uh, uh, Elijah after Elijah tells him to go to Ahab to tell him that he's there, Obadiah tells uh, Elijah this. 
And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Yep. Ah, wow. What is that place that Obadiah doesn't know about? The secret place of the Most High. That's right. God has been carrying Elijah around and around and around and then people come to the end of his life like, wow, a chariot of fire. It's like, this he knew how to steer that thing, you know, he knew how to get on it, he's been on it before. This man had been transported so many times before we get to the chariot of yes. fire. Suddenly he appeared to open eyes. Yeah. How did he know where he was? This is a great land, by the way, and he right. just went, he, I mean, he was always led by the Lord, but it doesn't say that he was led by the Lord and then found him, it said he suddenly appeared. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and so I, I just suddenly appeared. Yeah. Well, just in the same way that Jesus Christ and God can suddenly appear to you as you're praying. Oh, yeah. And you will hear his voice, or you will see his back, or you will feel his presence. He suddenly appears. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just come and sneak up on you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, and so Elijah told him and said, I will surely present myself to him today. I'm not going to be caught up in the spirit and then hide and have you be killed. And so then he appeared, Ahab came and met him and, and Ahab said to Elijah, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? <laughs> <laughs> and Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the balls. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Bar, B Baal, yeah. and the Baal, and the 400 prophets of or Baal, Baal, <laughs> the, the, the false prophets. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Those guys. Yeah, the bad guys. The jerks. <laughs> so this leads up to you know the moment in scripture everybody knows what happened on Mount. Mount Carmel, but we're just going to look at some of the scriptures because uh, it highlights just the, the personality of, of Elijah and the boldness that he had in knowing uh, God's word and fulfilling it and doing exactly what he's told. And so he's been prepared for this moment. And he felt that I alone am left the prophet of the Lord now. He was not made aware that there were 7,000 other prophets and prophets hidden in, in caves. He felt like he was alone in this. And, you know, the people, be, the, the false prophets began praying for a fire to come down and he ridiculed them, just to paraphrase. And then there was no voice, there was no answer, and no one paid attention. And then Elijah said, this is in verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. I love that because that's what God tells us, come near. Mm -hmm. Come near to me because you know what, if there's going to be fire, I want you to feel it. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be fire that comes down on this altar, I want you to feel the heat. Yeah. You know when you watch fireworks, you know, of course, it's like it, it makes you shake. It's like yep. really loud and it's crazy. But if you watch it from afar, it doesn't have as big an impact. So Elijah's saying, come here. Come on. Yep. You want to come see something? Come on. Come closer. Come near. And so the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that mm -hmm. was broken down. Mm -hmm. And... To me, that just speaks that there are so many altars that have been broken down in the churches today. And before <clears throat> anybody goes in prayers, there's so much reparation that needs to be done before God's fire can come down. Uh, we want God to come down <coughs> now. And we want Him to come down <coughs> on anything because He's God. But we don't take the steps to repair the foundation. <coughs> the foundation where the fire of the Lord needs to come down needs to be repaired before He comes with the fire. Yep, that's right. And so, and there was still a drought, by the way. <laughs> the drought was still on. It had been going on for over three years. And then Elijah asked them to do this. Now, water is probably worth more than gold at this point. Mm -hmm. It's for mm -hmm. keeping people out. Uh, water That's is right. worth so much. A cup of water. Uh, people don't mess around. They don't just spill water. Mm -hmm. There's a drought. There's no water. And so he said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the bird sacrifice <laughs> and on the wood. Wow, four water pots, I'd be like, eh, you sure you really need this? You know, that was a hot commodity. And then do it a second time, and then do it a third time. It's like, he's taking all of their treasure, everything that they've been gathering up and keeping, you know, to keep themselves alive, and asking them to basically pour it on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they did it. Mm -hmm. Basically, that was a sacrifice of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it came to pass that at the time of the offering, 
that Elijah the prophet came near and said. Again, that intimacy with God. This isn't Elijah coming near to the altar. This isn't Elijah going near to the people. This was Elijah going near to God. To speak to God, to have that intimacy with God. And he says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Again, the same prayer that he had for the widow, he has for the Israelites, that they would turn back to God. Mm. And they fell on their faces, and they praised God. And then Elijah executed all the false prophets. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he executed wow. healing and deliverance for the Israelites, and he executed judgments on the false prophets. Oh, wow. So there were two things that happened on Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. Yes, healing mm -hmm. and judgment. Healing Repentance and judgment. and judgment. Life and death, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's really all that happened at Mount Carmel. And so the drought ended upon this. And because Elijah said to Ahab, this is in verse 41, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. This is how intimate Elijah was with God, because even before he heard the voice of God, he heard the sound of the rain coming. He felt the feeling. He could, you know, sometimes before it starts raining, you can smell it in the air. Yep. And he's like, I hear the sound. I smell the smell. He just knew that it was going to happen. And so he said to Ahab uh, a little bit forward, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. This is after the seventh time of him praying. So he's told Ahab to prepare their chariot. And to prove to you, and what spoke to me and so greatly in these scriptures in reading this, is another time when Elijah was transported. Because here's Ahab in a chariot with horses. And then in verse 46, Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded his loins and ran ahead of Ahab. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Elijah the man could not outrun the chariot of the king. <laughs> I feel like that was like the hand of the Lord came upon Sophia and she held on for dear life and she went up. <laughs> he went super fast. And I've never looked at that scripture before. He ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. It was a transportation. Wow. Yes. Yep. This, this man was very was anointed. transportation. Very yeah. anointed. And so all this happened. This great giant triumph, right? And they go to the city and then he founds out what? That they're going to kill him. The Jezebel. The witch is very mad, and they're going to kill him. And so, uh, in, in chapter 19, he arose and ran for his life, in verse 3. He arose and ran for his life. God didn't tell him to go anywhere. He just arose and ran for his life. Mm -hmm. And this is where we find oh, Elijah wow. okay. taking a step without hearing the word of the Lord. Hmm. He arose and ran for his life. He didn't hear the word of the Lord before. Every, up until this point, it's been he heard the word of the Lord go here, and he arose and did according to the word. And here we read it, he arose and ran for his life? Mm. Oh, no. Mm. It was going so well for you. And this is where he falls into his uh, uh, weak moment. Yep. This is when he goes... Uh, and he sits down in the wilderness and sits by a tree and falls into deep depression. He gets hangry. <laughs> he doesn't have food. He sits there and throws, uh, uh, you know, we all have had these. Oh, nobody loves me. Nobody, the, you know, it, it, we all have these moments. That's why he's a man after that, that is just with similar passions that, as us. You know, he, he took a step uh, in fear running for his own life and found himself in, in a bad spot. Yeah. This is a man of God. He's not supposed to get depressed. He's not supposed to get anxious. He's not supposed to pray for the Lord to kill him. <laughs> Certainly not that. Yeah. That's a very bad depression. I mean, even depressed people don't pray that prayer. Yeah. So this is the consequence of taking steps without hearing the word of the Lord. Yeah. There was a lot of responsibility put on this man's head. He was not a normal prophet. He was a higher prophet. His calling on his life was great, and so his consequences are serious. But God is merciful. God is merciful because in verse 5, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat, you angry man. <laughs> you need some food. 
dude. <laughs> you need to level out, you know, because when I, I don't know, I'm hungry. I'm very emotional. <laughs> it's like somebody give this woman lunch. <laughs> you know, you just feel her. <laughs> yeah, you fall for you. You 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 let your emotions uh, run you sometimes when you when you're hungry or when you're tired or mm -hmm. when all these physical limitations come upon you. Satan just takes that and pounces on you. Oh, yeah. Any weakness is like, okay, I'm coming in, oh, <laughs> she's yeah. tired, yeah. you know, that's a great moment to put these thoughts in her head and then, ah, she'll go crazy. Mm -hmm. That's what the devil did with Elijah. Oh, yeah. oh, wow, he's depressed, he wants to kill himself, <laughs> pounce on him. Oh, yeah. And so the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, arise and eat. Mm -hmm. And he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him, because he was very hungry, <laughs> and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Mm -hmm. wow. And so what he's eating is more than food. Yeah. Greater yeah. is he that is in you that is in all. The journey is too great for you. Yeah. You need me. Yeah. You need Jesus in you. You yeah. need to listen. Yeah. to him and to be empowered by his food yeah. by his bread by the bread of life it needs to come in yeah. and fill you up yeah. and so he arose and that ate and drank has to be yes he needs food and so he walked for 40 days and 40 nights wow. it's so amazing that this man Elijah uh, then finally once he got to the cave and spent the night in that place behold the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, This is the word of the Lord that came to Elijah. I find it so funny. Brad, you know it. What are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> what are you doing here? He goes, ah, I've been doing everything for you, and there's no one else. I'm all alone. I'm paraphrasing, but basically, what do you think I'm doing here? Yep. <laughs> and so the revelation came to Elijah, not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire in the still small voice and, so, mm -hmm. and I love that because he had just spoken to all the Israelites through the mighty fire mm -hmm. and how he speaks to his prophets is different from speaking to his people yeah. uh, because if you are an anointed man like Elijah was if you are uh, uh, if you have a destiny for his kingdom here in the world you will need to hear the voice of God the still small voice yeah. that speaks to you. Not just be recognized in the mighty mm -hmm. and high powerful miracles. Yay, everybody was raised from the dead. But the still small voice that comes and whispers something sweet in your ear. <laughs> yeah. He heard it. And then he heard the voice was saying again, what are you doing here, Elijah? I love that because God asked the same question again. And Elijah gave him the same answer. Same thing. Same thing. And this is what the Lord said to him. This is the last scripture we're going to go on in verse uh, 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, Go, return to your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. And you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Saphat, of Abel, Mahona, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And so the man Elijah who had been feeling lonely all his ministry, he had gone from the dry brook to the mighty miracle on Mount Carmel that now being sent someone that would follow in his footsteps until his journey on this world was completed. And I just find it so encouraging that God takes the greatest people and puts them through the most humbling experience in order for the miracle to matter. And our miracle needs to matter and that's why we've been through the dry brook. And to go when we get to the top of the mountain where the miracle is, the miracle will matter because it took us a while to get there and it took training to get there and it took obedience to get there and it took hearing the voice of the Lord to get there and it took mm -hmm. obedience and taking one step at a time not knowing where exactly we're going. But constantly reaching out and being intimate and drawing near to Him and drawing near to one another so that we can hear that still voice of God in this place and in our own private time. This is what God is doing. And so the protection that we need, the protection that we need in the kingdom is protection from ourselves. 
to not take steps out of place, to not go in fear, not run for our lives. <laughs> Wait for the word of the Lord and then go. One, two, three, and he will lead you. And to just bring it back to the story, I didn't know where I was going. I went on the word of the Lord that came to me that said, if you don't get out now, you'll never have an opportunity to get away. Yeah. And so I, it was one phone call and then uh, I, it was just a crazy time. I had to book tickets to come back to the United States. Uh, you had seen apartments and I had never seen them, so I signed a lease without seeing the apartment. I didn't know. I just followed the voice of God. And this is a quick decision. This is like, I'm going to take two weeks to pray about it. No. Uh, sometimes you don't have time for that. You have to just say, okay, okay, Lord, your will, your will, your will. Yep. This is where it's going. Yeah. <laughs> and if we hadn't followed the voice of the Lord, what would have happened if I had followed my own natural voice? If I had known that the apartment that I was recommending to you was one uh, where there was a lot of things going on, that there was yep. crime that I didn't even know existed in that area, if I had known the statistics, I never would have recommended that. Yep. But God kept that knowledge away from me because it was important for us to be in close proximity mm -hmm. so that the support system could be there. Yep. It was walking distance from where I was at the time. Yep. And so God knew what we did it now. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing. It was the voice of the Lord mm -hmm. leading and guiding, even to the point where the Lord told us through another prophet, we were speaking on the phone to this prophet, you know him, the bishop. He's never been to the apartment. He said, uh, I want to tell you that where you're standing right now, I said, where? He says, where you are right now is holy ground. What? You and I were there that day. I said, this is holy ground? Yeah, it's safe zone. This is the safe zone, where you are. All around us were, wanting, she would call me, hey, helicopters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and all this stuff, I'm scared. But God said, this is holy ground. Have no fear. That's it the is the secret of place of the Most High. All around, there was all this nonsense going on, yet the Lord said, this is holy ground. This is safe ground. Mm -hmm. It was the secret place. Don't run to Paradise Valley thinking that that's where your salvation is. Don't run over there to wherever Rio Verde, Scottsdale, whatever, thinking that, oh yeah, that's safe. This place that doesn't look like the safe ground is the safe ground. Amen. And to me, you know, just recalling all those things, I say, wow, it's very important mm -hmm. to listen to the voice of mm -hmm. the Lord and to obey, to act in accordance to that voice. Notwithstanding what anybody else thinks or what even your own natural mind thinks. Mm -hmm. Just say, hey, God said it, we'll do it. And that's how God has been leading all this time. And you'll have his protection versus manly protection. Oh yeah. Because I don't want the protection, protection of flesh will fail. Mm -hmm. Even if you have a uh, guarded apartment complex or something. It's just so amazing. That's the protection of the Lord that we're seeking in this kingdom is you'll be protected if you are being uh, led by Him, fed by Him, and if the word is coming to you from Him. Yes. So, Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. That's it. Mm -hmm.